Hello, this week we're going to talk to you about the UK's biggest single incident loss of civilian life in the Second World War. Today we're talking about the Bethnal Green Tube disaster. Now at 8.17pm on the 3rd of March 1943, the air raid sirens sounded and the residents of the area made their way to their shelters. Within 30 minutes, over 170 people were dead and more than 60 people were injured but not a single bomb had landed within two miles. Cause it was the crush to get into the partially built tube station during an air raid. Now Bethnal Green, like many other tube stations, have been used as a public air raid shelter since 1940 without any problems whatsoever, even through the heights of the Blitz. It could hold up to 10,000 people and had frequently had 7,000 people sheltering it through air raids. It even had facilities added. It had a canteen, it had a sick bay, it had a visiting doctor, a concert hall and even a public library in there. This was a safe haven for many people who wouldn't have had Anderson shelters because they just didn't have gardens. What made the night of the 3rd of March 1943 different to all other raids previously was an almost perfect storm of combining factors and they, as subsequent news reports stated, turned the station from a shelter to a charnel house in 15 seconds. Now to start with, although the blitz was over, there was still quite a semi-predictable pattern to air raids. A few days prior to 3rd of March, the RAF had done a massive bombing raid on Berlin, the German capital. It involved 251 bombers. It dropped over 600 tonnes of bombs. It was the biggest and most destructive raid on Berlin the Allies had done so far. And so the people of London, recognising the patterns, were all well aware that a retaliatory raid was going to come to the capital. And when it came, it wouldn't be pretty. The people were a lot more on edge than they usually were. Then the sirens went off, as we say, at 8.17pm, just as they had done on many previous nights, and the people in the area began an orderly evacuation into the tube station from homes, streets, pubs, cinemas and buses, just as they had done on many previous nights. Throughout the day it had been raining and the 19 steps leading down to the tube station were wet, slippery and were only dimly lit with a single 25 watt bulb in keeping with the blackout restrictions. But the station could still get 150 people per minute through its single entrance without incident. But at 8.27pm things changed. Nearby Victoria Park, newly installed anti-aircraft rockets were launched. The people had never heard these before. To those people, they sounded like bombs. A bombs landing, within 10 minutes of the sirens going off, nearby, well that very easily turns into, the Luftwaffe have got faster bombers. And if the Luftwaffe have got faster bombers, then I need to get the safety as quickly as possible and people rushed. The 150 people descending the 19 steps into the dimly lit entrance became 300 with more people coming in from behind. In the darkness a middle-aged woman lost her foot and fell and when she fell the people behind her fell over her and people still pressed forward and those falls created space meaning that other people could come in at the entrance. Cinemas at this stage were still emptying, buses were dropping people off at the shelters in keeping with their usual routines. Meanwhile, 300 people were now piling up on the floor at the base of the steps. The pressure of the crush meant that they couldn't call for help. And those who could call for help were drowned out by the sound of the sirens and the rockets. And more people would enter the crush. Within minutes, the pile of people at the base of the steps was five or six deep. And when ARP wardens arrived on the scene, it was almost impossible to move anyone. 173 people had died of suffocation and 60 more required urgent medical treatment. In the aftermath of the tragedy there was the search for answers and the search for blame and the subsequent handling of the disaster has led to conspiracy theories and cries of cover-up that stay with us till today. Now following the disaster the details were suppressed, the wardens and doctors on duty were asked not to discuss it, the subsequent inquiry report was not published until close to the end of the war, which does look a little suspicious. However, the government's reason for this, as they stated on the publication of the report, was to prevent the public losing confidence in the tube network as a shelter. 
and doing so would have potentially endangered many, many more people. And I don't necessarily think that's an unreasonable thing. Also bear in mind, normal wartime reporting restrictions on absolutely anything meant that pretty much every mundane detail got examined and considered and then restricted until the correct line had been settled upon. And this was no different. Many newspapers ran with the story within a few days after the normal restrictions had expired. The London Illustrated News even ran with photographs. And in fact, a public relief appeal set up raised over £7,000 to help victims of the disaster, with £1,000 coming from as far away as Canada. So if there was a cover-up, it wasn't a particularly successful one. The almost immediate installation of a central handrail and white outlines on the steps leads some people to suggest that it was covered up because the government had refused the necessary alterations. The subsequent inquest did reference that the Borough Council had pointed out the lack of crush barriers back in 1941 and that the government had refused the budget to do so. But it also referenced that in the opinion of that judge there was insufficient evidence to suggest that this or the alterations requested by the council in 1941 would have actually prevented the crush. The inquest stated the disaster was caused by a number of people losing their self-control at a particular unfortunate place and time. Now, whether you believe that's the case or not, it didn't blame the government. So it's unlikely that the government suppressed the report to avoid the embarrassment or the public culpability. Now, there is one persistent conspiracy theory that drives us up the wall, and I'd like to deal with that right now. There are several articles out there that suggesting that there was no air raid on the 3rd of March 1943, and that the firing of anti-aircraft rockets was a secret test of that new defence system. And this makes no sense to us at all, for a number of reasons. Number one, if you have a new secret anti-aircraft weapon, then you test it somewhere like Salisbury Plain. You don't test it in the middle of the East End on a busy night. And it's not like it was a secret weapon anyway. It was a Z battery, like these ones pictured here. They'd been in operation in the UK since 1940. They were being used by the Home Guard. This is hardly technology that needs testing. They also know it works. And furthermore, while no bombs landed on Bethnal Green that night, the Luftwaffe very much did show up in an air raid. The 155 people killed on it would, you know, suggest that. Here is a map we've plotted of all the London districts that are hit by air attacks on the 3rd of March 1940. The red marker that you can see there is Bethnal Green. Now, given the surrounding districts of East Ham, Poplar and Islington all had bombs dropped on them that night. It is perfectly reasonable to suggest that Bethnal Green would use all the air defences at her disposal. Basically, the rockets were not a test. Now, in conclusion, there's no single cause for this tragedy, but ultimately damages were paid out to survivors and bereaved families. The uneven steps with loose woodwork were something that Bethnal Green Corporation had been told about, and the courts felt it could have been corrected. A total of £42,000 was paid out across 260 claims. Today the staircase is still there and now thankfully has crush barriers. The disaster is commemorated by a truly moving work of art, the Stairway to Heaven Memorial, where the names of the 173 dead carved on the exterior, hauntingly taking up the space that they took up when they died. This was unveiled in December 2017, more than 74 years after the disaster. And when we're allowed to travel to London again, please do visit it. The causes and effects will be debated forever, and we doubt that conspiracy theories are ever going to leave the public consciousness. And maybe that's no bad thing, because along with the memorial, they will help keep this in the public eye, where we can learn from it. We'll leave you to draw your own conclusions. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.